Welcome to this PBS 39 special report on the 2014 race for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. I'm Laura McHugh. This forum aims to help you learn more about your future legislators and encourages a respectful exchange on the issues that matter to you. Let's head over to Brittany Garzillo for the races we'll cover. Over the next hour, we'll introduce you to eight of the candidates running for Pennsylvania House districts, representing Lehigh and Northampton counties, specifically districts 22, 131, 133, and 138. We begin in numerical order with District 22. District 22 is a new district in Lehigh County, and it includes parts of the city of Allentown. It covers Center City, the Lehigh River waterfront, and southern portions of Allentown reaching just past Interstate 78. Now here's Laura with the Forum. Thank you, Brittany. Now let's meet the candidates. To my left, Stephen Ramos is a Republican running in District 22. We also have Democratic candidate Peter Schweier with us as well. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Stephen, let's begin with you. I give you up to a minute for introductory remarks. My name is Stephen Ramos. I'm running for state rep, and um, I believe that uh, I'm, uh, you know, best suited to represent our community. We have a very diverse community, and um, over the years, I've served in that capacity, representing uh, different people uh, you know, in different um, manners throughout uh, the years. And I believe that, uh, you know, with our community as it is, that uh, I can best serve them. Thank you, Stephen. Peter, introductory remarks. You have up to one minute. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the good people here at PBS for all you do for our community. I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking you for hosting us today. Uh, you know, I'm just a center city kid, uh, a blue-collar blue kid from downtown Allentown. And after college, my wife and I chose to move back to Allentown, buy a house here, and raise our family. So Jennifer and I have two wonderful daughters, Sarah and Erin. And it's really kind of special to me to be able to raise my children in the same town that I grew up in. And I'm very fortunate because of, throughout the majority of my professional career, I've worked to serve the people of Allentown. I was state representative Jennifer Mann's chief of staff for eight years. I currently work at Sacred Heart Hospital where I spearhead the hospital's community health and community development programs. And for more than six years, I've served as a member of Allentown City Council. And I have a great, I have a proven track record of results and I sincerely hope I can earn the vote of the uh, people of the 22nd Legislative District as their next state representative. Okay, Peter, we'll pose the first sure. question to begin with you and you'll each have a chance to respond. Peter, when, you, when we, uh, we want to begin with the economy. Sure. Although unemployment rates have declined over the past several years and we are seeing some improvement in that area, many would argue that job growth is not increasing as quickly as they would hope. Sure. What would you do to address job growth? Well, first and foremost, there really are very few issues that are more important to the lives of the people who live in Allentown than the ability to get a job. It's been said that uh, the best anti-poverty program that we can create is creating jobs for people so that they can go, to go they could have the, not only the financial ability to support their families, but also have that self-satisfaction of having a job. And as a member of Allentown City Council, we've, spe we've seen and I've been part of the process that has led to an explosion of jobs, both new jobs to Allentown and brand new created jobs here in the Lehigh Valley, uh, here in downtown Allentown more specifically. And I've put out a, 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 a jobs platform that not only focuses on creating new jobs, but creating the kind of jobs that will allow a person to, to, to sustain his or her family. I've called for an immediate increase in the minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. And I support the kind of job creation, like I said, in targeted industries that, so that it's sustainable, uh, through, uh, sustainable in the future, not just a one-time construction job, but the kind of jobs that, that, that will be there for the long run for our community. Stephen, how would you address job growth? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, especially one of the um, unique factors of uh, Pennsylvania is that um, compared to the rest of the states in the Northeast, uh, we actually have a, a lower burden uh, tax-wise. And so I think if we were to continue that process of making Pennsylvania a more attractive state for businesses to come uh, to Pennsylvania and especially to Allentown, that we can increase um, you know, uh, jobs uh, for the people of our area. Um, in Allentown, particularly, you know, while we look at the, the building boom that we're doing um, as, a, you know, hopefully a mechanism to help people get work, I think it's important that um, we make sure that we have an open and free market so that people can actually get those jobs um, and not put any obstacles to people trying to get work. Um, and so, you know, especially in Center City where, um, from what I've seen, we have a 15 to 23 percent unemployment rate. Um, it's important to make sure that uh, there are no barriers um, for people to participate in the job market here in Allentown. 
Specifically, Peter mentioned raising the minimum wage. Where do you stand on that? Um, I, uh, when I look at um, what economists have said about um, the minimum wage, you know, people like uh, Walter Williams or Tom Saul, um, and they've studied the minimum wage for decades now, and what they continue to show is that whenever the government intrudes on the marketplace, um, it actually affects negatively blacks, Hispanics, and young people. And so I, I don't think that the government should be intruding in the marketplace. I think we need to keep as much as an open process as possible so that people can get access to the jobs that they need to gain the skills they need to gain the expertise they need. Um, myself, I'm a self-trained uh, IT professional. Um, I have relatives that are self-trained in, in other trades. Um, if there were uh, arbitrary barriers that government would just set, we would not be able to get the skills that we need to, you know, um, you know, succeed in those fields. And so, you know, I believe that we need to make sure that government does not intrude on the marketplace and that we leave it as open as possible so that people can compete for the jobs that are there. I believe that this particular district is exclusively within the Allentown School District, yeah. is that correct? Correct. Right. So let's talk about education. The Allentown School District has faced a number of hardships yeah. over the past several years. Stephen, we'll begin with you. Uh, currently, is education funded properly? Uh, if so, uh, explain, and if not, please describe yeah. how you would change that. I mean, I think we need to recognize that we've spent a lot of money on the education of the children in Allentown. I believe our last budget it's like around $225 million. Um, that's an extreme amount of money. Uh, but uh, as someone who went to the Allentown School District, uh, one of the um, concerns that I've had even from when I was a student in Allentown is that we do not challenge our students enough. Um, when I was in high school, for years I argued with my counselors to get higher skill um, courses. Um, I had friends that argued to get higher courses. And so I think in Allentown, um, what we continue to find is that um, their curriculum is at least two years behind uh, compared to other uh, school districts. And so I believe we need to challenge the, the students in our school district as parents and as a community. We need to embrace education as something that is fundamental to getting out of poverty. Um, you know, and not just K to 12, but lifelong. People need to make the search for knowledge a lifelong endeavor so that as the market changes, they can adapt to the changes in the market and pursue new trades, new fields uh, to succeed in our country. And so um, education is fundamental. It is the best way that we can help people get out of uh, poverty, especially in a city like Allentown. And um, I believe we need to, of course, properly fund it. We need proper reforms, and we need to definitely challenge the students of our city. Peter, how do you and Stephen differ, differ when it comes to education funding? Well, it, education funding, I, I don't know that you're going to see many uh, more stark differences between Democrats and Republicans in this cycle than in education funding. Under Governor Corbett's leadership, we have lost a billion dollars of education funding on, uh, uh, since he's been in office. And the result in Allentown has been stark. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Sarah, is a second grader in the Allentown School District, something that differentiates my opponent and I. I send my children to the Allentown School District. My wife is a pre-K teacher. I started my career as a middle school teacher in West Philadelphia, and I'm a first-generation college student. So to say that, that education is important to me would be a gross understatement. And what I've found is in the course of the last uh, couple, uh, few years, we've lost over 400 teachers in the Allentown School District alone. Meanwhile, our property tax rates are going up. And the only way that anybody can explain and justify or, or rationalize the fact that we've lost teachers, we've cut payroll, and increased local taxes is because there's been less state support for education. So uh, priorities matter. We, we continue to fund corrections. We continue to, we continue to build new prisons out in western Pennsylvania. We are building a brand new prison and closing two other ones. There's a, there's a terrible lack of priorities in Harrisburg. Education funding has got to be the first and foremost. It's got to be the number one thing that we focus on in this, uh, in this uh, commonwealth. So how do you fund it? I would start with a 5% uh, uh, extraction, extraction tax from Marcellus Shale. I mean, we are leaving upwards of a half a billion dollars to a billion dollars a year on the table uh, by not taxing the gas companies in, uh, in the Marcellus Shale region. That is the first place to start. Second place is priorities. I mean, anytime you lay out a budget now, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has about $29 billion budget. As a member of city council, I've, I've overseen budgets up, upwards of $100 million of taxpayer money. And there's nowhere else that describes what you want to do in, uh, as, a, as an elected official than in your budget. That is the ultimate statement of priorities. So what you do is you, you, you prioritize education over other programs such as corrections. And I'd like to uh, just respond. Please do, and specifically um, address the Marcellus Shale tax. Sure, I'll do that as well. Um, you know, as far as education, to show you how important education is to myself, my family, um, we homeschool three of our children, and one of our children goes to a charter school. 
Um, when you look at the people who send their kids to um, school in Allentown, many, it doesn't matter what their background is, are looking for ways to make sure that their kids succeed. So they're looking at charter schools, they're looking at private schools, they're looking at Catholic schools um, to make sure that their kids have a chance in our nation. Um, I'll, I'll let you finish, I'm sorry. Um, so it's important that you know we recognize that the Allentown School District, while it has high budgets, it's not providing the education necessary for the families that are in Allentown. All right, so you have families looking for alternatives. As far as uh, uh, other funding sources, um, like always, you know, there's always a, a desire to create more and more taxes, which makes us less competitive as a state, less competitive as a region. And so we need to make sure that, again, we don't want to snuff out business in this state. We don't want to snuff out job opportunities for the people of this state, and especially the people in Allentown who are desperately looking for work. I'll give you a brief chance to thank, respond. Thank you. Two, two, two points there. First and foremost, to assume, Stephen, that people in Allentown who choose to send their kids to the Allentown School District, like my wife and I, mm -hmm. don't want what's best for our kids is patently absurd. And frankly, it's a yeah, little And offensive. I didn't say that. Didn't yeah, say yeah, that. yeah, you did, because you said people all over Allentown are looking for ways no, out. They second, are of all, sec, second of all, uh, and, and, and if I could, so I, I, I'm, I'm just going to stand mm -hmm. and say I'm correcting you on that one. Uh, second of all, to say Allentown spends enough money on our kids, when if you go to the Parkland School District just a few miles down the road from us, they spend on average four to five thousand dollars a year more per student. Mm -hmm. Our kids are being shortchanged, and it's because of the leadership of people like Tom Corbett. If you look at, I'm sorry, Free if you thing. look at how the state um, is funding, we, all of our budgets are suffering from pension, the pension crisis. And whether it's the downtown school district, whether it's the city, um, even though they've tried to fix that, um, we have pension plans way. continue to squeeze out the funding that's necessary. So there are more structural changes that need to be done. But within Allentown, I think the greatest thing that they can do is challenge our students. And if they did, you would see more parents having the confidence they need in our school district. Peter, I want to switch topics because you sure. brought up property tax relief earlier. This is a major issue from every leg legislator or candidate that I speak mm -hmm. to that there is a number one issue. Uh, many say it's the number one issue of their constituents. Um, I, where does this fall on your list of priorities and what would you do to address it? Well, the overall question is how do we make home ownership more affordable? And when you look at uh, when you look at property taxes, I'm very proud that in my six budgets that I've had as a member of city council, we have not had a property tax increase. So. Uh, quite honestly, much of the ability of uh, 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 the, the ability to resist a tax increase is based on your ability to govern. There's a skill to it. There's a technical side to governing. And as a member of council, I've never voted for a property tax increase. And in fact, we have not had one in the city. But the best way that you can reduce property taxes on the state level, there's two, there's two major programs. First is by funding education. Because really when we're talking about property tax increases, we're talking about school tax increases, at least in Allentown. So by funding education uh, more from Harrisburg, uh, you'll be able to do a better job of reducing property taxes or at least keeping them steady. And second, I'll make this a very quick, we have a program called the Property Tax Rent Rebate Program that's funded by the lottery. That has not been increased since the Rendell administration in terms of the uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the amount that you can receive back or uh, eligibility rates, and that needs to be looked at as well. Stephen, is property tax um, relief necessary? And if so, how do you address it? Yeah, I, I do believe that uh, when you look at the property tax, I think the way it's structured right now is structured in an unfair way, um, especially when you have a situation like in a city like Allentown where people have the ability to um, you know, make one um, home into a multiple unit building. Uh, they, that landlord actually gets to decrease his um, burden by spreading it out. Um, whereas a homeowner, a retiree, a senior citizen, they don't have that ability. And so they take on the full burden. I think that we need to move towards a more equitable type of taxing structure, whether it's an increase in the sales tax, increase in the income tax, but to get away from the property tax. Because that's the way it's structured right now, I think it's very unfair um, to homeowners in the city of Allentown. And of course, it also makes it uh, um, more difficult for um, you know, young families to get into a home to you know, be able to afford those homes. Um, so I think it would be, uh, if we want to help people, you can immediately put money into people's pockets by saying, you know, we're going to move away from this uh, tax structure and we're going to move towards something that's more equitable but the entire community is paying into the funding of our education and other municipal um, uh, budget needs. We are running out of time, so mm -hmm. we're going to move on to closing remarks. We'll each have about 30 seconds, and we begin sure. with you, Stephen. All right. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Ramos. I'm running for House District 22. I do believe that I am uh, best suited to represent our community. Again, we have a very diverse community, and uh, as my experience uh, in uh, working with many communities, uh, I believe I can best, uh, I'm best suited to represent them. Uh, I hope for your support. Um, I believe I, I, I will stand committed. My commitment is uh, to the workers of Allentown, to the people of Allentown, uh, to protect individual liberty, um, and to uh, you know, you know, fight for your interests.
And so I thank you for your time today. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Peter. Yes, and thank you so much for once again uh, having us here today. It's an important conversation. And throughout the course of my uh, uh, much of my professional career, I've had the opportunity to serve the people of Allentown. And I think, if anything, we, d we were able to demonstrate today that I share the same values as the majority of people of Allentown, whether it be job creation, supporting our education, increasing the minimum wage, or making sure that our retirees are able to, to, to retire with a certain amount of dignity, like when we talked about the property tax rent relief program. I sincerely hope that that, coupled with my history of success for the people of Allentown, uh, has earned me their vote, and I ask for their vote on November 4th. Peter Schweier, Stephen Ramos, thank you very much for your participation in this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is District 131. The 131st District covers the southernmost portions of Lehigh and Northampton counties. It includes parts of Mukunji, Emmaus, Coopersburg, and Center Valley. It also includes the northernmost parts of Montgomery County. Now let's head back to Laura with the candidates. Thank you, Brittany. Now let's meet the candidates. To my left, the Republican incumbent, Representative Justin Simmons. Also joining us, Democratic challenger, Michael Beyer. Thank you both for making time for this forum. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Representative Simmons, we'll begin with you sure. uh, with introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'm running for my third term, and I think it's important to remember where we were four years ago when I first ran. We inherited a $4.5 billion deficit in Pennsylvania. There was a billion dollar cut from the federal government towards our education system. Today, we have uh, eliminated that deficit. We have eliminated uh, that cut to education, and we now invest more money in education than at any time in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Our unemployment rate, when I took office, was over 8%. Today, it's under 6%. We are making progress in Pennsylvania. We are creating jobs, and we need to continue to finish the job, and that's why I'm running for a third term. Michael Beyer, would you please share some introductory remarks with our viewers and the voters in your district? Yes, thank you so much for having me here tonight. You know, Justin was right. He ran four years ago. And if you're pleased with the progress that we've seen over the last four years, I'd have to say to vote for him. But Pennsylvania is now 47th out of 50 states in job growth. He cut a billion dollars from education. Two years ago, they were crowing about it. You know, I'm a local guy. I went to Saucon Valley High School. And that school district provided me with a great education. And now if you look at the 131st district, they've cut over $14 million from our local schools. I promise you that when Governor Wolf is elected and I get to the State House, we'll work to restore those education cuts and we'll get Pennsylvania in the top five in the country in job growth and not the bottom five. Well, you know, I, I have to respond to that because it's just not true. Uh, obviously, um, my predecessor, who Michael knows something about, uh, c voted for the budgets that cutted education, that gutted education. And we were, were inherited with it when we came in 2010. We put $10.5 billion into education today. It's the highest amount in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. There's no disputing that fact. No, I mean, we are not spending more than we've ever spent in education. Yes, we the are. funding to the classroom is still below the 2008 level, and you know that. That's not true. You're using apples to oranges That's not, comparison. That's not true. If you go to Justin, it's my turn. I, I listened respectfully. Now it's your turn. Um, You've cut education spending. Go and look at your local school, bo school board's budgets. You know, Pennsylvania is now 45th out of the 50 states in state funding for education. We have the sixth highest property taxes. Four years ago, you and Governor Corbett campaigned on pledging property tax reform, and yet nothing was accomplished. And here you are, after two terms, running the same thing you did at, in 2010. I think you have to be held accountable for the fact that property taxes have gone up while you've been in office, and education funding has gone down. Mr. Well, Byer, let me address uh, the issue of property taxes. How would you address property taxes and give your voters and your constituents property tax relief? The most important thing that we could do would be to bring Pennsylvania up near the national average in state funding for education. Right now we're 25th, or excuse me, we're 45th. I want to bring us up to the national average, and that would provide each school district the opportunity to reduce property taxes directly. And, that and also, in addition, we could have a state program enhanced to give direct aid right to the seniors that live here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has the fourth most seniors in the, in the nation, and yet we have the sixth highest property taxes, and many seniors have a very difficult time making ends meet on a fixed income because every year when education funding is get cut, they have to pay more in local property taxes. And that's what I would do, increase state funding and reduce the burden on local school districts. Do you agree that property taxes are currently too high and if so, how oh, would you address it? absolutely. And it's, it's interesting he wants to add more state funding to education, but he doesn't talk about how he's going to pay for it, aka tax I'd be increase. happy to do that, Justin. It's a tax increase. 
Uh, I support HB 76, which eliminates school property taxes over four years, increases the sales tax by 1%, increases the income tax by about 1.5%, puts the same amount of money into education. I voted for it. Uh, unfortunately, it failed. Uh, I've been campaigning hard to get that passed. Um, you know, my opponent talks about money in the classroom, uh, and, and he's right. But you know what the problem is? We need pension reform. The pension system is taking more and more money out of the classroom, and we need to reform our pension system. Uh, the person on the top of the ticket that he's running on is saying we don't have a pension problem in Pennsylvania. I disagree. It's a $56 billion unfunded liability. It's a defined benefit system. We need to change that to give property taxpayers relief. Uh, would you address that issue of pension reform? You know, one more thing about you know education spending and the property tax bill that he talked about. You know, there are 80 co-sponsors on that bill, and Justin will tell you when it comes to the floor, they know it's not a real bill, and they only get 40 votes for it. It's a kabuki theater that they do in order to trick you that they and they campaign on it every two years. In fact, they've been talking about this same bill for 25 years. And Justin is still here after four years talking about it again. Well, what I, I want to do is, you know, like every other state that has an oil and natural gas industry, we put a severance tax on the Marcella Shale industry, bring in an additional $1.2 billion this year, and by 2019 it'll be $2 billion. And we'll use that money to directly fund our schools and reduce property taxes immediately. And that is a bipartisan bill because if it wouldn't fly in Texas, how is it that we don't have a severance tax up here? Well, one, it's, one, he's comparing apples to oranges. And I've said I've supported a severance tax. One of the things... No, you, Justin, you uh, voted I, against I, it four times. Excuse me, I'm talking. You voted against I'm, it four it's, times. It's, I've, I'm talking, thank you. I've, uh, we'll never, I've, never, I've never had a vote on a severance tax. I came into office, I voted for an impact fee, which has implemented $600 million to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania since it was enacted. When I was, before I was in office, when Democrats had power, when my predecessor was, was in office, they had a chance to vote on that, and they never did. They never voted for a severance tax. They never voted for an impact fee. We implemented an impact fee. I've said I support a severance tax. I'm also, though, not going to lie to the people and use the severance tax as a panacea for everything. It's much like Ed Rendell did years ago, when he, if you remember the gambling program. Gambling was going to lower property taxes, was going to eliminate the state deficit, was going to change Pennsylvania for good. You know, gambling's done some good things for Pennsylvania. But to sit there and act like a severance tax is going to be the panacea for everything uh, is just a lie. You know, you know the policies you want to implement, you're going to have to raise the income tax on middle class Pennsylvanians. You know you will. You're, the, Justin, you already, Mr. Byer, I'd like to give you the yeah, chance Justin, to Justin, you already proposed raising taxes on regular Pennsylvanians earlier in this debate. And the other issue is, you know, by eliminating the school property. No, taxes? but you you want to raise their income tax. You want to raise their school property And I want to do it. Hey, can I? Let me finish here, Justin. Well, you're lying. I'm not lying. Yes, you just said you, you wanted to raise it. Please give uh, Mr. Me, Byer the opportunity, it. and we will give you the chance to respond you know, before moving on to the next topic. You, you keep bringing up 2010. It's 2014. You guys have had four years to implement the policy. If you go on the League of Conservation Voters website and you look at Justin Simmons' rating, he's the worst rated legislature in, legislator in the Lehigh Valley in environmental issues, and they show you the four times he voted against the severance tax bill. If you don't trust me, look it up, and you'll see that Justin's deceiving you. And that is a problem that we have with the legislature right now. We have legislators in there that are career politicians like Justin Simmons who talk with the same campaign every two years. It's time to hold them accountable. It's time to make Pennsylvania strong again. And it's time to enact a severance tax, fund our schools, and get Pennsylvania in the top five in job growth. A very brief rebuttal before we move on to the yeah, next well, you know, if, if I'm such a career politician, you know, I don't take the pension. I don't take the per diems. Are you going to reject the perks? No, I'm not going to take any of those perks. And I can tell you, you're Justin, not. that you're only entitled to a pension if you serve for eight years. You pledged to only serve three terms. So you're, you're promising you're not, not to take, take something. I'm not taking the pension. Okay. And I can tell you that because I am not here to be a career politician, but you're, you're promising not to take something you're not entitled to. That's not a promise, and that's the kind of slight deception that you campaign no, on. No, it's not. I don't, I don't t get a pension. I'm not going to take a pension. I could invest in it, and I've decided not to, so that's okay. not a deception. I don't take the pension. Let's move on to an issue uh, that's very close to uh, a lot of people who are watching, and that's the issue of jobs. Although the unemployment rate has declined since the last election in 2012, uh, many people argue that the job growth has not sure. happened quickly enough. Representative Simmons, we'll begin with you. What would you do to address the issue of job growth in Pennsylvania? Well, you know, we are started the phase out of the capital stock and franchise tax, which is a detriment to businesses in Pennsylvania. And that's part of the reason why our unemployment rate has been going down. A big problem in Pennsylvania today is the corporate net income tax is 9.99%. 
That's the highest in the country. If Pennsylvania wore, uh, were, were a country at our, at itself, we'd have the second highest corporate taxes in the world with, in addition to the federal taxes. So we need to lower the corporate net income tax in order to bring businesses in Pennsylvania. And I certainly think that's probably the biggest thing we could do to bring business to Pennsylvania. Mr. Byer, how would you, uh, you know, address that issue? As I said before, issue? we're 47th out of 15 jobs. And, and Justin's right, we do have a high corporate tax, but the problem is we have so many loopholes, like the Delaware loophole, that Justin and, and Governor Corbett, who he strongly supports and he votes with 98% of the time, have that's opposed cutting. And that's so, if you're a small business on Main Street, or you're even a medium-sized business, and you don't have a huge accounting and legal department, you're paying a 9.9% tax. But if you're a Marcella Shell oil drilling company who does billions of dollars of business here in Pennsylvania, you're paying 3%. And that's wrong. We absolutely need, I couldn't agree more that we need corporate tax reform, but we need to close the loopholes so that, so that everybody's using a, a fair playing field. And then once we do that, that will attract more jobs. The other thing we could do is, there are tons of incubators, there are Benjamin Franklin innovation centers that are in all our local schools here in Lehigh. We have the Benjamin Franklin Innovation Center and they've been creating new businesses with high-tech jobs that pay well and unfortunately under Governor Corbett and Justin Simmons they're never able to get the funding they need to build those jobs here in Pennsylvania. If you look at the development in Allentown which Justin Simmons opposed, I, I, I challenge you to go to Center City Allentown and look at the redevelopment and the revitalization that's happening and when Justin was representing Allentown he was opposing it and that was a bipartisan bill that has revitalized Allentown, and that's what we need now. We need a bipartisan legislator. We, we are running out of time. Mr. Byer, if, if elected, uh, Mr. Byer, if elected, what would be the first piece of legislation you would introduce or co-sponsor? The first thing that I would co-sponsor would be the severance tax we, and to restore education funding. That should be the number one priority here in Pennsylvania. And that would be, a, and then it's a common sense bipartisan bill. You look around the nation, I could, that's exactly how it's done. And that would bring in the revenue that we need to refund, uh, or excuse me, restore the education funding cuts that have happened under Governor Corbett and Justin Simmons while providing that property tax relief immediately without talking about bills that have been brought up and are stale and have, will never pass. Representative Simmons, what would be the first piece of legislation you would introduce or co-sponsor? Well, absolutely, we, we need property tax reform. Um, we have, I have little old ladies that come into my office every week um, literally crying because they have to determine whether they're going to pay their heating bill or they're going to pay their property taxes. We need property tax reform. The way to get there with the first step is pension reform. Michael Byer, Tom Wolf have said that there is not a pension problem in Pennsylvania. It's a $56 billion unfunded liability. 90% of the private sector is in a defined contribution system. We need to put all new employees in the public pension system into a defined contribution system, much like the taxpayers that are paying their benefits are in as well. I'll give you the first word in the closing remarks, and we'll end with Mr. Byer. Uh, closing sure. remarks, you have approximately one minute. Well, I appreciate you, you having me here today, and it's been an honor to serve these past four years uh, in Harrisburg. I've certainly seen a change in the culture in Harrisburg for the better. When I got there, uh, people like my predecessor um, milked the system and made hundreds of thousands of dollars off things like the per diem system and the pension system. Uh, that's why I don't take those perks. Uh, when I got there, state, uh, state representatives didn't contribute anything towards their health care. Today we do. Uh, we're changing the culture in Harrisburg. It's not just a matter of increasing spending all the time. Before I got in the office, in the eight years of Ed Rendell, it took a uh, spending increase by 40%. It took 200 years for Pennsylvania to get to a $20 billion budget. It took eight years of the Rendell buyer years to get to a $28 billion budget. Spending increased by over 40%. And we are trying to change that culture in Harrisburg. It's your money. It's not our money. And I respect the taxpayers, and that's why I'm fighting for them in Harrisburg, and I would appreciate their re-election vote. Mr. Byer, one minute for closing remarks. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I, I think everybody needs to tell Justin Simmons and Tom Corbett that it's not 2010 anymore. They're not running against Ed Rendell. They're running on their record. And unfortunately, what we've seen is 47th out of 50 states in jobs, 45th out of 50 states in state funding for education, 44th out of 50 states in funding for higher education. And it's time for a change. It's time that we get legislators who have the right priorities, who aren't going to increase prison spending by $300 million while they slash your kids' education budget by a million. Kids should have kindergarten. You know, if you go look at Upper Perkyoman School District, one of the new areas that Justin Simmons is campaigning to represent, their band uniforms are literally 15 years old and falling apart. 
and they're afraid to even ask for new band uniforms because the funding cuts are so dire. If you look at our local library system, they're all in desperate straits trying to make, keep their doors open. If you look at, you know, East Penn School District where they've lost seven million dollars in funding. They have a very difficult time giving all the services that they need. And I can tell you that if you elect me and Tom Wolf, we're going to go to Harrisburg, we're going to make the oil and gas industry pay the same severance tax they pay in Texas, and we're going to do, what the prior we're going to have priorities that you do and make sure your kids get the quality education that they need to succeed in the 21st century. We are out of time. Thank you both for your participation and for your passion on these issues. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. The third race in our form is District 133, which covers eastern Lehigh County. It includes Whitehall, Copley, Catasauqua, West Bethlehem, and Fountain Hill. Now here's Laura with the form for the 133rd Legislative District. Now let's meet the candidates. To my left, Representative Dan McNeil, he's the incumbent Democrat. We also have with us David Maloney, the Republican challenger for the 133rd District. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. We'll start. We'll give you each up to one minute for an introductory <coughs> statement. We'll begin with Representative McNeil. Okay. First of all, I want to thank PBS for having us today. Uh, my name is Dan McNeil. I represent the 133rd District. As we all know, there'll be a lot of redistricting going on this year. I no longer have any of Northampton County. We lost that through redistricting. Uh, my first year, my first term, I should say, was very challenging in Harrisburg and being in a minority of a Republican Senate, a Republican House, and a Republican governor. Very difficult to get things done if you don't have any bipartisan measures going on in Harrisburg. Uh, a lot of candidates are thinking it's I will do this and I will do that and I will do this. It doesn't work that way. It's a we thing in Harrisburg. If we don't get bipartisanism in the state legislature, we will have nothing and we will be able to get nothing done. And uh, other than that, let's just move on with the program and that will be my introduction for today. Thank you. You're let's welcome. hear next from David Maloney. Hi, I'm Dave Maloney. I've uh, run before for this seat and, uh, and one of the things that I bring to the table is that uh, in my profession, which I do acupuncture Chinese medicine, um, I've actually passed, worked through and passed and, and gotten uh, through the House, Senate, and by a Republican and a Democrat governor, uh, three bills uh, from soup to nuts. So I am I'm fully aware of how the whole system works. I've worked with it before. I'm aware with the people uh, that I'll be working with, and uh, I plan to uh, work hard for the uh, people of my district, which is Eastern Lehigh County. May I ask for a clarification? In what role were you uh, involved with those bills that you had? It was it was grassroots. It was basic, basically me and uh, one other person. Excuse me, one other person um, going and visiting legislators and and being very patient. Uh, working with um, we started off with a, a single big bill, moved it down to three smaller bills, which are much more palatable for the legislators. Thank you very much for the clarification. Uh, we'll begin with a topic that's uh, very important to many of our viewers, and that's job growth in the area. Although uh, unemployment rates have decreased since the last time uh, your, your can these candidates met in 2012, uh, many uh, would argue that job growth is not occurring quickly enough. Representative McNeil, if elected, how would well, you address the issue of job growth? Thank you very growth? much. Statewide unemployment is terrible. Lehigh Valley, with these new projects, the last uh, year and a half was a banner year, but there's still a lot of unemployment left to be done. We have to figure out a way how to get our middle America, our middle class, back in to the job growth. Ten dollars an hour isn't going to cut it. There'll be, there will be no Social Security in ten years because at ten dollars an hour, there'll be no money put into the fund. We have to get industry back into Pennsylvania. Maybe, maybe lower some corporate rates to compete with overseas to get these companies back into Pennsylvania and get our job and our middle, middle class America growing again. How would you address the job growth? Well, for, first, one of the things we have to look at is, is job growth is two different aspects. What, what we're growing right now is a lot of part-time jobs, and there's no full-time jobs for people, very few full-time jobs, and people have to work really hard to achieve them. So one of the things we need to work on is, is working on bringing more full-time jobs into the area. And we can do that through a variety of ways, but one way is to, is to make it easier for corporations and, and businesses to be able to work here. 
So I think that's one of the most important things. Um, as far as, far as uh, uh, raising wages, uh, that in my mind many times ends up hurting people as much as helping them. So it helps some people and hurts others because it, it reduces the number of jobs available. Did you want to respond? I don't think you could live on $10, $10 an hour. I think a fair wage is $20 an hour. If you think you're going to have an economy grow on people with less wages, like this gentleman said, it's not going to work. It just cannot work. It's impossible. Could you live on $10 an hour? I can't. Could I live on $20 an hour? No. Could a person making $40,000 a year with two children pay a car payment, a mortgage payment, an interest payment, feed them, clothe them on $40,000? I don't think so. David, we'll if, give you a if, moment if you, to respond. If you, if you look at everybody uses McDonald's as an example, well, McDonald's is a, a company that hires people fresh out of never having worked before. You have to start somewhere. Um, somebody who is entrepreneurial in spirit, wants to work hard, they work, they work their way up in McDonald's to management, they understand how the process works, they get another job, and they're working their way up. But uh, to, to start at, you know, to start at a low wage is just normal, especially for part-time and kids working after school. Let's uh, begin our next question with sure. you, which deals with the issue of education funding, which has been a major issue. Um, do you think education funding is currently adequate? If so, please explain, and if not, how would you address that issue? It, it, education funding is, is a very complex issue, and so just me saying I would do this, one of the things we have to do is, is to remove education funding from um, housing and, and put it on to a combination of, uh, say, a sales tax and uh, an income tax process. But originally in the 1800s, what we were doing was we were subsidizing, we were having the wealthy landowners subsidize uh, the schools. And that formula no longer works. We have to change that. I've been involved in the last maybe three months with education funding. It seems to be that we can't come up with a fair funding formula for schools right now. Uh, it's a very difficult situation about funding because every school district in the state is different. You might need X, 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 I might need O, 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 or I might need more money. For instance, Allen Down School District is a depressed school district right now. They're gonna need a lot more money than say, uh, a lower Mac or Northern Lehigh or something like that. So to come up with an adequate, an adequate fair funding formula is going to be difficult to do because now you've got politics in the play again. And then you're going to have reps from this side of the state saying, well, I need this and you don't need that and I need this. So right now I, I don't know really what the true answer will be for funding formulas, but I will say this, charter schools are, very, are hurting are hurting, hurting, hurting our public education. And the result of it is public education is doing 95% better education-wise on students than any charter schools. And when I say that, I'm not talking about a charter school that is in K, K5 through 12. K5 through 12 to me should be totally public education. If you want to open a charter school that isn't K5 through 12, that's fine with me. But we're, we're, we're sending kids to these schools. For instance, Allentown School District last year, if they would have took all their charter schools back and did them themselves, it would have been $6 million. It cost them $20 million to support charter schools. And this year, it's projected to be $30 million. How could you get a fair funding thing with things like that? And what is going to stop your property tax from going up? We'll get back to the issue of property tax in okay. a moment, but David, since uh, Representative McNeil brought it up, what is your stance on charter schools? Um, one of the things, one of the processes involved in charter schools is that they get subsidized by the school district. And so in Allentown, the, the, the funding for Allentown is, is, is totally wrong. I mean, what's happening is the property values are going down, so the school district makes less money, and then they have less money to spend on everything, and they have to share that with charter schools. Um, I'd like to see the charter schools put up more money for themselves and, and to, to develop a, a different formula for that. But I do think, I do think it's useful to have competition in schooling. 
uh, in order to be able to, uh, to, to stimulate the competition. I think that's important. Representative McNeil, I want to get back to the issue of property taxes that you brought up. Many voters uh, rank property tax relief as one of the most important issues to well, them. Where, where excuse me. Right now, property tax release, relief is my biggest issue in my district. We have a lot of senior citizens that are getting a rise, a rise every year in property tax relief and not getting any income put into their Social Security or any other pensions or anything. Uh, Senior citizens are really hurting right now, homeowners, senior citizens. I personally think that all the money from the gaming halls should go totally into property tax relief, 100%, and start relieving these people of Pennsylvania with this burden on these high property taxes. And like David said, I believe in competition, and competition is correct. But when you're 95% better, and somebody else that's doing the same thing, that is in competition. Those are facts. David, where do you stand on property tax relief? Well, I, I've been going door to door from the beginning and I've, I've seen almost every house in my district. And, and I have talked to a lot, a lot of people, including people on fixed incomes. And it's not only fixed incomes from retirement, it's fixed incomes from injury, it's, it's other aspects of things. And, when, you, when you're on a fixed income and school taxes go up, you have to make decisions about you know, almost what am I going to eat or, or certainly am I going to sell my house. And so we're seeing more houses for sale. Um, when people buy their house in order to be able to have something they can live in the rest of their lives. And, and I think that's totally unfair. It has to change. And, and, and I think it can happen. <coughs> I've reserved approximately one minute for each of you to make a closing statement. We are running out of time. Okay. Representative McNeil, you can go first, and we'll give uh, David the final word since you had the no first problem. word in taste for him. My first term has been very challenging for me. As you know, I'm a 67-year-old freshman, which is unheard of. But it's been very rewarding also. As being in the minority party, we saved privatization of liquor. We saved non-sale of the lottery to a company named Camelot that is owned by the school board in Canada. We've stopped Corbett from doing that. We need a lot of change in Harrisburg. Marcellus Shale should be taxed. They're paying it in other states. They should be paying it here. We have a budget this year from a governor with no revenue. You know yourself you can't support a home with no revenue. And then my, my last statement would be going back to property tax relief. Senior citizens now are selling their homes. People, I'm sorry people, younger people that are out working that aren't making a good wage can't afford to put the 20 and 30 percent down to buy a home today. And that's why your market is flooded. Younger people don't have good, kids coming out of college with college loans at five and six percent, owing two and three hundred thousand dollars is absurd. We live in a country, we live in the best country in the world and I don't think any child should have to pay college tuition. David, you'll be getting the final word. There's a lot okay. to respond to there as well. Well, my, my number one um, thought is always about people. My goal is to represent the people in my district or Eastern Lehigh County. I think that's the most important thing. Um, the most important thing relative to that right now is that the people who are hurting because of the school taxes and the way, and the way they're achieved. We have, we have to find a new way that has to change almost as soon as possible and we have to have people really work who are going to really work to make it happen. Um, as, far as, as far as schooling, I think that we need to, we need to uh, look at K through 9 and people, in, instead of being able to read and write K through 12, they should be able to read and write K through 9 and, and 10 through 12 should be an extension on that. We, we need to be more responsible. We need to work with people who have language problems and we need to change it as soon as possible. Thank you both very much for participating, You're David welcome. Maloney welcome. and Representative Dan McNeil. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. The fourth and final forum in this special covers District 138. The 138th Legislative District is located in Northampton County and includes parts of Bethlehem Township, Hanover, Bath and Wingap. Let's head back to Laura with this forum. Thank you, Brittany. Now let's meet the candidates. Starting to my left, we have Representative Marsha Hahn. Marsha is a uh, Republican running for re-election. 
Next to Marsha, we have Leslie Altieri. Leslie is the Democratic challenger in this race. Thank you both for being with me today. Oh, thanks for having us. Representative Havan, let's start with you. Can you, uh, each of you, start out in a minute or so, give us an introduction to who you are and why you, uh, voters should vote for you? Sure. Thank you. And again, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I am the candidate, the Republican candidate, and the incumbent for the 138th Legislative District. Um, I am running for my third term. I, lifelong resident of Northampton County, uh, lived in the 138th District uh, just about my whole life. Uh, know the people, um, get out, talk to them, and uh, do a lot uh, of events with them. Um, I have two children and four grandchildren that attend school. The, the grandchildren attend school here in the Penargel School District, so education is of importance to me. Um, and I just think it's, when I ran, I worked for a legislator for a number of years and um, filled his unexpired term. And I think it was just important for me to, to be out there, um, taking it to the next level, helping the constituents in the district, um, and to make sure that we keep the taxpayers in mind when we're voting on legislation and listening to both sides of the issue. Thank you very much. Leslie, I turn to you. Would you introduce yourself to our viewers and the voters in this area? Certainly. Thank you, Laura, for having this forum today. My name is Leslie Altieri, and I'm running for state representative in the 138th district in Northampton County. I first came to the Lehigh Valley in 1998 to attend Moravian College, which is where I met my wonderful husband, Brian. And after that, we decided to build our home in Bethlehem Township to become part of the growing community. I've worked as a juvenile detention officer and counselor, so I've seen kids on the negative end of the spectrum. And to me, that's really instilled the need for a good education up front. I volunteer at our county animal shelter, which is where we adopted our cat, Chevy. Um, kind of looks like Garfield. And I'm running to represent my community to make it a better place to live in, to work, and raise a family. All right, ladies, thank you very much for those introductions. Let's get down to the issues. It's a much different climate than it was to even two years ago economically. Uh, we are starting to see some rebound in, the, uh, in job growth, and I'd like to know what each of you would do to continue that momentum. Leslie, let's start with you. Well, we definitely need more jobs here in the Lehigh Valley and throughout Pennsylvania. Um, we can do that for giving incentives for small businesses, uh, making loans easier to get, um, having networking resources um, so people know where to go to get help to get off the ground and running. Uh, we need to do infrastructure improvements. It draws more businesses to the area. And I really believe we need to raise the minimum wage so that we can support um, the working class and have a vibrant middle class family sustaining job. Representative Hahn, what would you do to foster economic growth in the area? Well, I think tax incentives are important. You have to be careful how many tax incentives we're giving. We have the Angel 34 tax credit. That's helping the small businesses so they can come up. Um, and I agree. I think one of the things we need to look for on the education end, but help with job growth, we hear there are going to be a lot of welding jobs, for instance, coming into this area. So I think we need to look at the vocational technical schools to make sure that we have the workforce that's ready for these jobs as they come in. And I think that's important. We have to have good, strong workforce um, available and bring the companies in that, that will have the manufacturing jobs. Leslie specifically mentioned uh, raising the minimum wage. Where do you stand on that particular issue? That's something I think we have to be very careful with. We need entry level positions. A lot of the minimum wage jobs are there for high school students or uh, starting out maybe with no skills so or minimal skills so that's a good place to start uh, I want to be careful that we don't give them minimum wage or raise the minimum wage and then they lose all their benefits um, I had a, a woman in my district who um, started an entry-level position she had three young children single mom and when she started it just enough to keep her off the food stamps and things that could help her so I want to make sure that we're not hurting them as long as you know as well as uh, taking the benefits away. So I think companies can raise um, the minimum wage, you know, can give a higher salary. I talked to another small business owner who said, well, I want to be competitive, so I pay higher than minimum wage. And as long as they have skill sets, I pay more than that. And I think we need to look at that. Leslie, uh, Representative Hahn also brought up tax credits. Where do you stand on the expansion of tax credits? Um, it, it's certainly something to look at because um, it, it's hard to start a business. And I know that Restaurants, for example, um, have a high rate of not being successful within the first two years of um, 
just really supporting our businesses here in the district is important to me. And going back to the minimum wage, the reason that I see raising it to be of vital importance is because if you're making minimum wage, you barely bring home a little over $14,000 a year. And that's not enough to raise your family on, especially if you have children. Um, people work hard and they deserve an equal day's pay. When we talk about take home pay, one of the major issues I hear from voters again and again is property tax relief. My property taxes are through the roof and rising. Representative Hahn, let's start with you. What would you do for property tax relief if you think it's necessary? I am a co-sponsor of House Bill 76, uh, which would eliminate the property tax. And whenever we talk about elimination, it's actually tax shifting. Uh, you're never going to be able to eliminate the property tax completely, but it will shift it to uh, an increased sales tax or under earned income tax. So everyone's going to pay um, a little bit more. There's going to be winners and losers, and that's the problem. And we're such a diverse state that we couldn't even get it passed in the House. The Senate's working on it. I'm hoping the Senate brings something back this week uh, that we can vote on. But I think it's something we have to look at as I'm out going door to door talking to people. That is the biggest issue that I hear. People are losing their homes. Uh, a lot of seniors who just have to make decisions. Do they buy food? Do they get their prescriptions? Do they pay their property taxes? And uh, it's hurting people in this area. So I think it's a, a very big issue that we have to look at and, and keep working on. Leslie, what would you do to uh, address property tax relief? Well, property taxes, we need to fund programs on the state level properly. Um, for instance, we need to tax the Marcello Shell gas industry at at least 5%. We are the only state in the country that doesn't tax that, and we have the capacity to raise over a billion dollars within the next two years. We also need to close the Delaware tax corporate loophole where large businesses go and don't pay their fair share to Pennsylvania. And I think that if your mom and pop pizza shop down the street is paying their fair share, we should ask that the large corporations certainly pay their fair share. When that happens, things are paid for correctly on the state level, like education, uh, veterans benefits, social services, programs for our seniors. And then it's not such a burden on our, our taxpayers here in the district. And our school taxes keep going up because the state keeps lowering, lowering down what they are contributing towards education. I know that a lot of property tax, tax uh, payers want some type of reform, and I believe that there should be reform, but I don't support eliminating it completely because it's a regressive tax that will hurt a lot of middle class families, lower class families. Um, when you go ahead and raise the sales tax to 7% and start taxing food and clothing, um, if you're on a budget, that extra winter coat that, that winter coat that you need, you might not be able to afford if, if the taxes go up. So I really think we need to make sure that we're supporting our entire community there. Representative Hunt, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Thank you. Um, when you talk about not funding schools properly, we, do, we have more money, state dollars, and that's where you never hear from the other side um, correctly. Previous administration put in the federal stimulus money. That was going away in two years. The school districts knew that. Letters went out to all the superintendents. And the school districts in this area um, worked with that and are pretty good with that. Um, but state dollars, we have more state dollars in education. And um, I think we have to be, I'm always telling people the school board elections are very important when you vote for your school board members because they handle the contracts, they handle uh, what happens when they're building new schools. So I think that's important. I think if you have, if you own property and we switch from the property tax to the sales tax, you can control what you spend. Um, the plan that's there now would eliminate clothing up, uh, anything over $50 would be taxable. So you can decide how you want to spend that money and how you're going to put the fair share in there, but everybody would be putting into that, uh, not just the property owners. And I think that's something we really need to look at. Leslie also addressed uh, taxing Marcella Shale. Where do you stand on that? Again, you, you talk to five different people, they want to put that money somewhere else. They, we never hear about the Marcella Shale is taxed at the corporate. We have the highest corporate net income tax, 9.9 percent. They are paying um, you know, I think we just did the impact fee for them, so Northampton County uh, did benefit from the impact fee that's coming in from Marcella Shale. So I want to make sure the jobs that we've created with Marcella Shale stay here. It does impact the Lehigh Valley. I get letters from companies all the time that thank me for saying, for supporting that, that um, we are seeing jobs from the Lehigh Valley in the Marcella Shale, Shale area. And when you go out there, I visited that area, the economy's better. Things are better out there. So I don't want to see a business leave that we're helping, that's helping the economy. Leslie, I'll 
pose this next question to you. You okay. would be a new representative if elected. What would be uh, one of the first pieces of legislation you would either co-sponsor or sponsor? Well, I, I do believe that education is key to our future. And during the past four years, during the Corbin Hahn administration, we've sustained major budget cuts in and it's become a tax burden for our community. We've lost a lot of teachers and programs like art and music for our language. Our class sizes have doubled. All of our property taxes keep going up and that's not right. And as my opponent here will tell you, um, they increased funding for education and that's just not true. Um, what they did was put the education funding and combine it with the pension funding and when they look at that number, it's higher. But in all reality, in the last four years, education funding has gone down decreased every year and I want to make sure that we put our children first because our children are our future here and I believe that needs to be a top priority. So okay. while that's not a piece of legislation itself that goes into the overall budget and impacts just about everything because depending upon where the funding's going um, is where what else goes from there. A slightly different question to you Representative Han. What is your proudest vote or your proudest bill that you've sponsored up to this point in your career? Um, one of the committees that I serve on this session is the Agricultural Committee. It's the number one uh, business here in Pennsylvania. So when I'm out listening to people um, talk to a, a group of farmers, and one of the things they were telling me about were high tunnels, that um, they have a problem. Some of the taxing authorities tax them as permanent structures, which they're not. Uh, they're used a lot for um, greenhouses, the, the round buildings that you see on some of the farms. So I introduced legislation um, to help them to make sure that the local taxing authorities do not tax them as permanent structures and help the, uh, the farmers with that. Uh, we've passed uh, the inheritance tax elimination so that people with farms can pass them on to their families and the families aren't losing them and, and having to sell them for uh, building developments and we can keep the farms intact. Uh, we have about a minute left, so I'd like to give you each about 30 seconds to uh, give a closing remark. We'll begin with Representative Hahn. Okay, thank you. Again, you know, I think it's important that you're out listening to the, the constituents doing uh, what they want. I try to listen to both sides of the issue. Um, I try to be fair, and I try to vote for the district, and I would appreciate the support of the constituents. Uh, they feel that I'm doing a good job, and uh, I'd just like to continue what I've been, what I've been doing for the last four years. And Leslie, since Representative Hahn had the first word in this forum, we'll give you the last. Thank you to PBS for hosting today's debate. Um, over the past four years, as I said, the Corbett administration, with the full support of my opponent here, rubber stamping his agenda, has made detrimental cuts to our state's education system, and as a result, our property taxes have increased dramatically. We need to invest in our children, in, our, in the school and global economy, as they'll be, become our future. I pledge that when I go to Harrisburg, I want to work to restore our funding for education, our social service programs, our veterans' benefits. I'll fight to raise the minimum wage and support working families across Pennsylvania, create good paying jobs, um, family sustaining middle class jobs, investing in our infrastructure, and su supporting small businesses. I, I support um, the anti discrimination bill, which is House Bill 300, uh, because I believe it's the right thing to do. Um, I'm running to represent our community to, to make it a better place to live, to work, and raise a family. And I humbly ask and for your support and vote on November 4th. Thank you both for participating today. Thank, Thank you, you not just for your time, but for your respect of each other and the issues that are important to our voters. Thanks for having us. To find your legislator, visit house.state.pa.us. And to learn about voters' rights and registration, you can go to votespa.com. We thank all of the candidates who participated and encourage you to vote on Election Day, Tuesday, November 4th. Pressler Wolf & Miller Insurance offers a full range of personal protection and coverage choices as your family grows. Pressler Wolf & Miller proudly protecting the families of the Lehigh Valley since 1923. Cedar Crest Genetic Engineering women really want to be in charge and be leaders in their scientific community. What makes a gene turn on? Why is your brain cell different from your heart cell? I really got that hands-on experience right from the get-go and it's very possible for anyone coming into Cedar Crest to be able to get that hands-on experience right away. It's really the fact that Cedar Crest had the genetic engineering program 
that sold me. To explore genetic engineering at Cedar Crest College, law.